It's Monday, February 3rd, 2003. I'm Wolf Blitzer in Washington. What was the fatal flaw that turned a seemingly routine space shuttle landing into a disaster? That's the question facing experts today as they continue the painful investigation into the last flight of the shuttle Columbia. CNN Space Correspondent Miles O'Brien is joining us uh, with all the latest developments from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Miles, tell us what we learned today. Well, Wolf, let's get right to it. We're going to learn something right now from the shuttle program manager, Ron Didamore, just began his briefing. Let's listen in. I don't hear audio. I don't hear audio. Progress. I don't hear audio. But it's a massive it? job. Help me uh, out and here. And it, it takes all of our attention on a daily we basis. Get, I need dip. gathering information, reviewing our engineering analysis, and planning for the future on what we need to do both in the coming days and coming weeks. <clears throat> Identifying the items that uh, are being recovered is time consuming. It's difficult, but uh, as we met with our people in the field today, we understand that uh, the process of collecting the debris <clears throat> and relocating it to our staging areas is uh, really picking up steam, and, and uh, I think that's going to progress rapidly over the next couple of days. As of yet, I still do not have any recovered items of any special significance. However, we have put in place a process whereby if we identify something that we believe to be significant, we will red tag that particular piece of debris and immediately send our engineering and technical people to review it. Literally hundreds of people are involved around the state and hundreds supporting in many different locations. I mentioned to you again the National Guard the local law enforcement, state officials, FEMA, EPA, FBI, NASA officials. Just a large cooperative effort that well to try to help us understand the cause of the loss of the Columbia and its precious crew. Today I intend to give you uh, additional updates and technical data. I know there's a lot of information or a lot of interest in the, uh, the, analysis, the analysis that we performed during the mission on the uh, debris impact to the uh, wing, and I will talk to you a little bit more about that today. I also have some information that, uh, <clears throat> some additional information on the timeline as far as what happened and when, and, and I'll update you on, on those, uh, those events. But before I, I get into that, I would like to take some time and, and talk about the members of this team. As I've watched them respond to the events that unfolded on Saturday morning, at all times it was a group of individuals, certainly with sadness and disbelief in their eyes, but never a hint of panic. These men and women performed flawlessly, recognizing that they had lost members of their family as we treat the crew members in this community. They continue to stay at their post and do the jobs that we needed them to do. I'm extremely proud of the members of our team all across the country. A wise person told me a long time ago that true character is revealed when you come face to face with reality and when you come face to face with adversity. And certainly these, these last few days have been a real challenge on us personally. But I couldn't be more proud of the team under difficult and adverse circumstances, they have performed in the highest 
manner. And they continue to do so. Tomorrow, as you know, <clears throat> we're going to pause and reflect upon the crew of Columbia, their lives, their contributions, their memory. And although we cannot stop our investigation and the recovery effort, we will pause in this location to take the time to reflect upon their lives, their sacrifice. It's a day of remembering. It's a day of remembering our friends. And for us, it's a day of mourning. Out of respect for the crew and their families, I will not do a press conference tomorrow. I will meet again with you the day following. If there is any significant events that occur, we will alert you to those events that will be done out of NASA headquarters. But for us, tomorrow is a day for our reflection and, and a day for us to pause from these activities for a small time. Let me talk to you a little bit about the timeline and update you on, on some of the changes that uh, from yesterday. I'm going to run right down the timeline as I did yesterday, and I'll try to identify the specific engineering um, information that has changed. At 7.52 a.m. Central Standard Time, I believe I started yesterday at 7.53. I'm going to back up one minute. At 7.52 a.m., we have identified that three left main gear brake line temperatures showed an unusual temperature rise. This was the first event, the first occurrence of a significant thermal event in the wheel well on the left-hand side. At 7.53, as we were passing over California, we've identified that a fourth left brake line, strut actuator, and uplock actuator temperature measurements rose significantly. Yesterday, I reported 20 to 30 degrees increase in five minutes. Now we believe it's more on the order of 30 to 40 degrees. At 7.55, a fifth left main gear brake line temperature showed unusual temperature rise. 757, as we were passing over Arizona and New Mexico, the upper and lower left wing skin temperatures failed off scale low. At 759, as we were passing over West Texas, I mentioned yesterday that we had evidence of increasing drag on the left wing that the aero surfaces were reacting to that drag to maintain our attitude and trim. We also now have identified that in addition to the aero surfaces, that the um, yaw jets on the right-hand side, two of the four yaw jets were firing. They fired for one and a half seconds, again, trying to help the aileron and the elevon surfaces counteract what we believe is the increasing drag. And although I said yesterday that it was well within our capability to maintain attitude, it was well within the flight control system's capability to handle the excursion, as we have continued to pour over the data, it's not the absolute value of the attitude change that is interesting. What is becoming interesting to us now is the rate of change. The aero surfaces were doing what they needed to do to counteract the drag on the left side of the vehicle. The right yaw jets had to kick in to help the aero surfaces. And it appears that we were losing ground as far as the rate of attitude excursion. And it was not long after that point that uh, we lost all data and communication with the crew. We are still looking and processing for, uh, we're still looking for additional information. I talked to you yesterday about 32 seconds. Um, retrieving that data is not as easy as we originally thought. 
And so uh, it may take us another day or so to extract that information and determine whether it's going to be useful to us. We also hope to go out directly to the White Sands terminal where the data comes down from the satellite directly into White Sands. It's then relayed from White Sands over to the Johnson Space Center. We're going to go directly to the White Sands equipment and see if we can extract additional data. And so that's, that, that effort is continuing. So again, uh, the, uh, there is certainly an interest in the wheel well. Caution you about conclusions. A temperature increase of 30 to 40 degrees in five minutes within the wheel well 